we are already two decades into the 21st century and the technology has taken very big strides and <coughs> the technology is not what we had 20 years back and our lifestyles have changed a lot and also the, we are much more comfortably, comfortably placed with respect to our livelihoods. And when we go back home and we have sufficient food on our plates and there are quite a several number of people who do need dark chunks of food on the plate which goes waste. However, to this development of technology and to the apparent nice living standards which we have, there is a poignant side, a very unfortunate side which day in and day out most of us are not aware of. We are not aware that on some part of the world and some part of this country there are almost 850 million people who go hungry, who do not get one meal and they sleep on that empty stomach. That is the FAO data. And much more painful is that every minute 70 people die of hunger. That means by the time I finish my talk, 800 humans, our own brothers or sisters, have already died of hunger. That is the tragedy which we Although we don't face it, that lives with us. It's a big challenge for every one of us that this does not happen and it stops. Another sad part to this is from the FAO data is that 3 million children below 2 years die because of malnutrition. So today, hunger and malnutrition are very serious problems across the country, across the globe and most of this problem is associated with the African and the Asian subcontinents. From this point of view, it becomes our prim primary duty and effort, all efforts should be pointed towards that direction. How do I think, how do I feel as an agriculturist and as a, a scientist and as a human being that what can be done to mitigate this problem. I have drawn from all my experience all through my life here and I have just found that there are two things which have to be focused so that at least we can address this problem of hunger. There are two uh, things when I speak of agriculture which comes to my mind one is agriculture, which as you everyone is immediately is aware of, is the production of cereal crops such as wheat, rice, maize, etc. And added to that are the vegetables and of course the fruits. The other aspect is the dairy products. Okay, by when I say of dairy products, I essentially mean the milk and the milk products thereof. So from this, how, what do I think, how do I feel, how do I see this problem could be solved? This I can explain from the point, the experience which I have gained all these years and from some real time stories which I have seen happening and which could be replicated elsewhere in the globe so that uh, one can uh, uh, see the problem again. The first one, of course, I will not be much talking about how biotechnology can improve the crops and all that because this lot of uh, uh, work has been done in that regard and biotechnology has improved the uh, crop productivity. And the agriculture, the uh, two limitations at the moment which we see are all crop plants have attained genetic, uh, genetic saturation. That means that we cannot do any more experiments 
with respect to plant breeding or biotechnology unless and until some other new breakthrough comes to improve crop productivity as such. The other limitation which we have is the actual arable land. We have actually come to that limit also of using the arable land. So we do not have much options. So what are the options left to us? The one thing which comes to immediately to the mind is what about the non-arable land? Means that part of uh, land which has been just not utilized because of maybe it is a sodic soil with high soil content, maybe uh, alpine soil, maybe not an availability of water, or maybe the soil structure is such that it cannot be used. The other uh, thing uh, which, uh, so this uh, utilization of non arable land is one thing, in fact, uh, those commercial companies which are much more intelligent and are seeing the future are already buying large chunks of non arable land around the globe. However, that of course is a commercial angle, but that will not help the hunger, hungry people anywhere and anywhere. So, the model which we, I have been seeing here at Dalva is one of the most sustainable models. And this has been there in practice for the last hundred years. And I have tried my hands and learned most of the agriculture here. So, what is this model? Here, this place is a semi arid land, and most of the uh, land here, about uh, 50 70 years back, was a completely non arable land. Scientists from abroad and every uh, place had come, tested the soils, tested the surroundings, everything, climate, etc., and have said that this is a hopeless place. Nothing can grow here. And any resource you put here, in terms of human effort, monetary effort or anything will be wasteful. So just don't do anything. But it is this sheer effort and sheer human endeavor and hard work and the guidance of the leaders of this place that the whole land has been transformed into a green bowl. This place had at that time huge, huge mounds, almost 50 to 20 feet high mounds of sand and a lot of Sakata Munja, which you call as Sakanda, has been growing almost everywhere with a uh, lot of wild date palms also growing all around. So this land was cut down to size and raised and plain and all these uh, channels and canals were built and the entire chunk of land now has been converted into a beautiful green uh, place and one can grow all, all the three crops here of Ravi, Kharif uh, and also Jain. So much so that all the cereal crops, the wheat, rice, rice is one thing which requires a lot of water as the people are aware, can grow here, can be grown here now. And also maize and of, of course then all types of vegetables, pulses, any pulse you name can be, uh, is being grown here. And cash crops such as sugarcane or even banana, which again requires a lot of uh, effort and a lot of water. Which in fact, uh, again, uh, it was said that banana cannot be cultivated here, has been cultivated. And so, so in fact, uh, this place gives us a, uh, an idea how human effort and how human uh, endeavor can change the entire scenario and um, uh, convert a land which was completely non arable into an arable land. And such types of land uh, occur throughout the globe. Almost it is estimated that 30% of the land around the globe is non arable in one form or the other. So uh, that land can contribute immensely towards the increasing of production and contribute to the football of the globe. And such experiments, now we have, uh, this experiment was almost 100 years um, uh, old and has been real success story. Similar experiments we have started at different places in the foothills of Himalaya 
where uh, there was not much water available. However, by properly utilizing the resources available at that place, we have been able to grow a very beautiful orchard. And also, in this part uh, of uh, Agra itself, on about uh, 20 acres of land, again, um, what the scientists call as carbon dead soil. A carbon dead soil is one where there is no organic content in the soil. When there is no organic content in the soil, the scientists, agriculturists say that nothing can be grown unless you dump in a lot of organic manure into that green or otherwise. But then putting a lot of green manure or organic manure in 20 acres, 30 acres, 50 acres or 100 acres, not a really feasible story. So what we have done is in this land we developed an orchard and in that we have put to start with uh, three feet bags uh, and um, in each of the bag we fit the with, uh, farmyard menu and put it uh, at different places and put the, uh, the fruit increase in there. And today in that localized areas and other areas, in fact we have conducted the experiment even without such bags, but now we have the whole land, it is only a couple of years old and the whole land is now completely covered with greenery and we have already started getting strawberries, guava and soon we will be getting maybe we have put olives also there and a lot of other fruit trees uh, which will soon be fruiting. So this is another story which uh, shows us that uh, non-arable land which the scientists call could be converted into arable land by putting efforts. The second of course the aspect which I will be also be covering is first get the land, harness the land and then think of increasing the productivity which comes next. Okay, so this this is one area. Recently we have taken up another challenge, big challenge in the Gangetic Plain near Varnasi where we we have been provided with large chunks of almost 10 and 20 acres of land which is completely sodium where nothing can grow. So this is our new challenge and we'll be uh, we'll be working on it. We are we have already started working on it and soon I hope to get good results of it. So this is one thing which um, I strongly believe that first get into action and get things started. Once we are into it, the solutions all are automatically and things get started and things happen. So, uh, so cultivating on non-arable lands and or harnessing non-arable lands is one of the most potent and possible solutions for this aspect of increasing productivity. Of course, one of the major problems is that most of the hungry people are in the developing nations. And most of the, uh, uh, the farmers, nine, 900 million of them according to FAO, are in developing countries. Though, of course, the developed countries produce a lot of food but food is produced in these developing countries also but uh, naturally they are hungry because the productivity is low. And another aspect associated with this is that most of these farmers in developing countries are small holding farms. They don't have much land. So even if they get good productivity, it's not sustainable. So what do they do? It is the community farming. The land belongs to the community. And the whole community is involved in tilling the soil. They put real time effort. They slog, they sweat, and then they produce all of the land. And whatever is produced is for the community. It is consumed by the community, so no one is hungry. So similar models could be adopted by the small and marginal farmers, and uh, about a thousand acres and or, or more land could be accumulated and cooperative systems should be developed and such uh, community based or cooperative system based farming could be taken up by these <laughs> communities and they, with, the, with the motto that whatever they produce is by them and whatever they produce is for them and any surplus could be either stored or could be sold in the open market. Of course, as I was <laughs> referring earlier land, you have the land 
you have the way with it. But as I have said, most of the problem is with the developing countries and the problem is the optimal production from the land itself. The land is there, but you are not able to produce optimally. Sufficiently, you are not able to produce. The productivity is so low that the, it is not able to sustain either the family nor is able to contribute towards the market nor is able to uh, develop, uh, contribute towards the nation development or to mitigate this problem of hunger. So what the, the, now after uh, harnessing any land, the next step of course is how to increase the productivity. Here comes the new technologies which have been developed such as the precision uh, farming and where the, which will be a completely, which is a completely sensor based system where uh, the, uh, everything is scientifically based, soil analysis takes place and the crops are given only that much <laughs> nutrients and which are required for the development of and rightful production or optimizing the production. We, if all A is towards optimizing the production of the crop. Each crop has its own demands. So from that point of view, the precision agriculture uh, technology tells you beforehand uh, the, <coughs> the oncoming of monsoons and the temperature changes in the soil and in the atmosphere and how, uh, what is the irrigation time and uh, how much nutrients a plant requires. In fact, the technologies have advanced so much that the robots or even the uh, tractors could be fitted with these uh, sensors, RGB sensors, which go around the field and uh, just check out whichever field is or whichever part of the field is uh, in requirement of a particular nutrient and that much nutrient is added to the soil and, uh, and so you conserve on the uh, fertilizer resources and also on the water resources. In fact, the fertilizer giving or the, uh, the uh, monitoring of the crops could now be done using drones also. You might have heard that drones have been used by USA mostly to, as a bombardment agent. But the, the, the beautiful side of the drones is that they could in fact be much more effectively used to monitor the crops and distribute the fertilizers as and where and wherever they are required rather than spreading the fertilizers throughout uniformly and wasting on your resources. So this is uh, another way in which uh, one can increase productivity and conserve the resources. Then of course the problem is having more, the problem is of having more. One should realize that affordability is not the criteria of buying things. It, is the, it should be need based. So one should actually buy or eat only as much as one requires and leave whatever we leave will always be used by somebody else and that will contribute to the larger bowl of food which is required by the other people. So uh, having said that the other aspect of course is dairy which could also be the productivity increased by using community dairy. Uh, of course Anand has already started but Anand does that for commercial purposes. But one can use that example for community dairy in such a way as Bambak does it here and the milk is produced and utilized by the community and the products developed from that are utilized by the community at a reasonable rate. That is it my friends and I request you all that sometimes we will uh, say sometimes just think that there are 800 million people, hungry humans around the globe. Thank you very much.